percent to their own low concentration, you know, 80 percent, in an attempt to equalize that. That sounds kind of like fudging. And so there's a, another way of looking at this that kind of, I think kind of helps explain it. Now this only works if the membrane, you know, lets the water back and forth, but not the proteins like a living cell membrane. And uh, basically, let's see if I can find a, uh, yeah, I can use the bottom of this uh, to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about here. Uh, is because uh, these are permanent markers, so once I do this, <laughs> it's done. All right, so here's a, you know, here's one of the pores in the membrane, uh, and uh, we'll say, you know, here's the water molecule out here, and so the, you know, water molecule dancing around, you know, can. Uh, get in uh, to this pore, you know, it's from several different angles and so on. But now let's uh, take, uh, imagine we put a great big protein molecule on the inside. So here's a big protein molecule. And so in effect, what the protein molecules and other big molecules in the cell do is uh, make it harder to get out of the cell. So a water molecule coming from this angle, you know, could hit and and still bounce into the cell. From this uh, angle, you know, could hit and still bounce into the cell. Could come at this angle, you know, get into the cell easily, or this angle and get into the cell easily. And so you might say there's a, if it hit dead on, you know, it might bounce back out. But there's basically a large, I'm thinking this three-dimensionally, a large cone of entry. So I'll put it that way, large uh, cone of entry. There's uh, lots of ways that a water molecule can get in. Okay, easy in, that's another way to say it. It's easy to get in. But when a water molecule tries to get out, let me, I'll switch over to black for that. Water molecule tries to get out. Lots of water molecules are blocked. This one, you know, it hit that, would have gone through, but this thing's in its way, so it just bounces out. This one would have gone through, but it bounces away. Same thing on this side. So there's really only a few water molecules at a steep angle that really can get out of the cell. And so it's uh, because of these uh, protein blockers, okay, we can call them, uh, then it's hard to get out. And so they tend to accumulate uh, inside of cells. Okay, and so that's, uh, that's what's going on here, kind of at the statistical level. And so water is diffusing from its own high to low concentration. And basically what's going on is all the clutter inside the living cell is making it harder for the water molecules to get out than it was for the water molecules to get in. Well, let's face it. If water molecules keep coming in, what? It's going to build up some pressure. Okay, so the cell is, you know, it's already full, and now your brain absorbing more water, so the cell is going to tend to swell up, and, and so it's going to create a pressure here, and this is called osmotic pressure. Uh, now, some of you think osmosis is a theory of learning. It's not, okay? <laughs> so, you don't learn, you know, just by sitting next to someone who's smart and absorbing. <laughs> uh, but osmotic pressure is a real phenomenon, and uh, it supplies the power to the plant world. And, you know, plants don't have muscles. In fact, you know, they would think it, it would be, you know, offended at the thought they had to use muscle power. You know, how many of you could grab the corner of the foundation of your house and just lift it up? Okay, not many of you can do that. How many of you have ever seen a little sapling? Grab the corner of your house and just lift it up. <laughs> or take your four inch or six inch slab of your driveway and just split it apart, you know, and move it away. Or crack big boulders in the mountains and so on. Osmotic pressure can do all those things. And so <coughs> osmotic pressure is a tremendously powerful force. And it enables plants to do tremendously powerful things. Uh, and so it, osmotic pressure, in a sense, serves as. Uh, you know, the muscles in the plant world. And an average cell like this will have about six atmospheres of pressure, which would be about 90 pounds per square inch of pressure. Uh, and there are zillions of these little cells, and the pressure can be really inexorable. And they can do a lot of damage, or they can do a lot of help. Uh, you know, cracking boulders, building soil, things like that are generally beneficial. Lifting sidewalks, moving foundations are generally not beneficial. <clears throat> and so this is a tremendous kind of force. 
Uh, there's one, I may have, I don't know, I may have told you about this on another occasion, uh, but there's a little orchid uh, in Australia that makes use of osmotic power, uh, sometimes called a hinge orchid, sometimes called the, the hammer orchid. And so, uh, like orchids, it's got four petals kind of here and there, and then it's got one petal uh, kind of out in the front. And in this particular case, this little petal um, that kind of stands out like that is colored like the abdomen of a female wasp. And so as a male wasp flies around, notices this, lands on this petal that looks like the abdomen of a female wasp, and the weight on that you know, is transmitted to the little stalk that holds up the petal, and there's a little osmotic thing, little osmotic hinge there. When that hinge is triggered, and that's where it gets the name hinge orchid, but when that hinge is triggered, wham, <laughs> gets the name hammer orchid. <laughs> The petal flips up, wasp and all, slams the wasp into all the into pollen, and of course the wasp winds up dusted with pollen, and as he flies out of sight, you can hear him say, wow, what a woman. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, plants can do all sorts of things with osmosis. Uh, this is also, of course, uh, uh, crucial for transfusions. Not only do you have to get the right blood type, uh, but you know in the field you may not have time to do uh, you know blood transfusion based on type, so you can just transfuse plasma. Uh, but you don't want to just use distilled water. And so if you say you know see somebody bleeding and their blood volume is going down, you, you almost can try it because they're going to die anyway. But if you inject them with distilled water, that water rushes into the red blood cells and they all explode. So you've actually maybe hastened their death. Or if you make it too salty, you know, sucks the water right out of red blood cells and they all crinkle up and don't function anymore. And so you need to have just nine tenths percent salt solution uh, is the uh, osmotic balance of blood. So just a little bit of salt. You know, and distilled water could save somebody's life that was bleeding too much and you didn't have anything else to, to give them. And so osmosis is extremely crucial. It's just a special case of diffusion. It's usually you're talking about something diffusing in water. In this case, you're talking about the diffusion of water. And it's through a membrane that lets water through and holds other things back. And so that would be osmotic pressure. Well, now, in, in animal cells and in human cells, the results are what I mentioned. Uh, if uh, too much water flows in, the cell just swells up and bursts. Uh, if too little water is available, the water gets sucked out of the cell and it just shrivels up you know, and dies. But plants can go a step further. And so plant cells uh, live inside uh, little wooden boxes. Okay, so they have a cellulose cell wall, and cellulose is the fundamental fiber that makes up uh, uh, wood. And incidentally, cellulose wood fibers are just strings of sugar molecules. And so actually, if you could hold a, you know, a wood chip in your mouth long enough, <laughs> it would eventually taste sweet. <laughs> now, there are very few things that can really digest wood fast enough for you to notice that. Where starch is a string of sugar molecules, but they're put together in a different way. They're easy to digest by comparison. But wood's still made out of sugar, but they're lined up in a way that very few things can digest. Uh, but plant cells that have this wooden box around it. And so now, osmotic pressure draws water into the cell. In fact, plants are kind of designed uh, with uh, uh, above average osmotic pressure, so they tend to suck water out of the soil. Uh, and so the soil, you know, wet soil, is going to have less osmotic pressure than a plant cell will. And so the water is going to flow from its own high concentration of moist soil through the cell wall and membrane into the living cell. And so uh, uh, osmotic pressure, uh, osmosis itself, as you can think of it as a suction pressure, uh, a, uh, a cell with a high osmotic pressure means it has a high tendency to absorb water. And so plant cells are designed with that. Now if the soil gets too dry, and so you've got a little bit of water and a lot of soil mineral, then the soil sucks the water out of the plant cell, and what does the plant do? Wilt. Okay, so that's all that happens when it wilts. But in normal soil, you know, the cell will suck the water out of the soil, 
But as it does so, it swells up. Well, why doesn't it just burst? You know, like our cells would or an animal cell would. And the answer is the wooden box. And so they have this uh, wooden box, this cellulose wall around them, that stretches. And so the fibers are kind of like this, and there's a little space, and they can stretch and line out better. And so as they stretch, what? They generate a back pressure. Uh, and so a uh, turgor pressure, I think, yeah, down here. And so turgor pressure is the back pressure exerted on a cell by a stretched cell wall. Now, we can't do that because our, our cell membranes are too weak to really exert any pressure. They just break. But plants have this wooden outer box, and so they can fight back. And as osmosis brings in a lot of water, causes them to swell up, the stretch of the cell water pushes the water physically back out. And so you can reach a balance where water coming in by osmosis equals the water pushed out by trigger pressure. And usually the cell is in a turgid condition. And that means it's kind of firm, full of water. And most normal healthy plants are like that. You bend them over, you know, and they snap back. When they're wilted, it's a whole different story. And so plants actually use turgor pressure, uh, you know, as their skeleton. And of course, it works very well. You know, holes of redwoods, you know, uh, 300 feet in the air and so on. And so this uh, works quite well. Uh, osmosis drawing the water in. Turgor pressure tending to push the water back out again. And so then you introduce this term here, DPD, diffusion pressure deficit. And so that's again kind of a quote suction pressure. The tendency of water to move into a cell, uh, the higher the diffusion pressure deficit, the greater the tendency of a cell to absorb water. Uh, and so it's the osmotic pressure drawing the water in minus the turgor pressure pushing the water out. And so those are two competing forces, uh, you know, in a plant cell. Now notice, by the way, that we've already left the, the animal world and the human world. This doesn't apply to us, because we can't generate the turgor pressure. So now we're getting into plants only, uh, and this is where they generate a lot of power. Well, how much power? Okay, and so uh, here you take a look at, uh, uh, you know, a little plant, and I'll, I'll enlarge the bottom diagram down here. So here you have a... A plant, and we can think of this as a little seedling just sprouting out of the ground, or a redwood tree 330 feet in the air. Uh, and so down here at the bottom, uh, you have moist soil, and uh, the diffusion pressure deficit uh, in moist soil may be virtually, uh, uh, you know, hardly any at all. Uh, it doesn't have any tendency to absorb water. You know, the extra runoff just flows over the top. So that would be moist soil down here. I'm not really sure why I would put one minus one to zero would be a right number or a tenth. Uh, the uh, you know diffusion pressure deficit of moist soil is usually about a tenth of an atmosphere, uh, not much more. Uh, I sketched a little thing here to show you close up uh, what's going on. So this would be a root hair cell. So this would be on the outside of the root, and a lot of the cells on the outside of the root have little hair-like projections. Not really hairs; they're still covered with the uh, the woody fibers and so on, but they stick out to increase the area for absorbing water. And so the six here tends to be pretty much uh, the osmotic pressure in a typical living cell, and that's based on the amount of proteins dissolved in the cell. And so six atmospheres are roughly 90 pounds a square inch. Well, what's this minus five? Well, a root hair cell that's out there in moist soil is absorbing water swelling up, generating a back pressure uh, from the cell wall. And so the second figure, in fact, I can go ahead and put those in, the top figure would be the osmotic pressure. Uh, that would be the pressure pulling water in. The second figure would be the turgor pressure uh, pushing water out. And so you're going to get to a point, uh, you know, you can subtract these two, and the <coughs> tendency of uh, uh, water to move into the cell then is just bottom number. And so at the, uh, the root hair cell, you know, the root hair tends to absorb water from moist soil. Now, dry soil, it's not going to work. But from moist soil, it absorb water. The cell wall will begin to stretch, push water back out. But what? It doesn't just push it back out into the ground. It pushes the water into the cells above and below, left and right, and toward the middle. And so some of the water pushed out by turgor pressure uh, goes into the next cell toward the middle of the plant root. 
And so the plant root, uh, the middle of the plant root, may still have an osmotic pressure of 6 based on the amount of dissolved material in it, but it will begin to absorb water pushed into it by the root hair cell next to it, and so its turgor pressure will begin to build up. But of course, uh, you know, it probably wouldn't build up quite as much as this out here, because this is constantly pulling in fresh water. So the turgor pressure might reach 4, and the net tendency then for that cell to absorb water is 2. And so because of that, there's a tendency uh, for water to move from the soil into the first cell, into the root hair cell, and a tendency for water to move from the root hair cell into the cells of the interior. Now, it was absorbed from the soil because of osmotic pressure. It was pushed into the interior cells uh, by turgor pressure. But now you get the, the real fun part is the xylem. So this stuff out here, uh, xylem is a term a lot of people know about it. So this is the, the woody part of a, of a, a tree or a plant. Uh, and xylem is mostly just wood fibers uh, from dead cells. And that's kind of, in fact, uh, xylem doesn't even work if it's alive. It's not even xylem if it's alive. And so these things were alive. I mean, they were formed originally as living cells, but they deliberately uh, commit suicide <laughs> or autolysize themselves. They, they self-destruct for the good of the whole. It's not a wasted effort on their part. Uh, they're sacrificing for the good of the plant. And so now you have this hollow, uh, thick-walled tube that can go from, you know, deep in the roots all the way to the top of a redwood tree. Well, how are you going to get water in that? And so just plain soil water that has minerals dissolved in it anyway has an osmotic pressure, uh, you know, of about four. Just, just soil water in general that would have some osmotic pressure. But notice, if that were the end of the story, if it were just osmosis, then the plants, the roots, would be sucking the water out of the xylem and be moving back into the root, and it'd never get out of the root. And uh, so what kind of turgor pressure do you have in a xylem cell? And the answer is zero. If there's no membrane, you know, to hold things together and allow for, uh, you know, the uh, continuous accumulation of osmotic pressure to stretch the cell wall, you can't get any turgor pressure. So a dead cell is like a pipe. It can't really do anything, it's just there. Uh, you know, so water pipes in a house are like xylem, they're just there. They have a certain size diameter and that's pretty much it. Our blood vessels are quite different. You know, our blood vessels are stretchy and alive. And so they can actually flex and contribute to, uh, you know, moving fluid along. The plants don't have that. So their turgor pressure is zero. Their net diffusion pressure deficit is four. So the water moves into uh, the xylem. But notice there are two different reasons here. The water moved from the soil into the root here because of osmosis. It moved from the root into the xylem and from then on up because of turgor pressure. Now, uh, there is, I was going to make the point, or I will make the point, that basically plants get to circulate fluids. They get water to the top of the tallest redwood without spending any energy whatsoever. You know, we spend an enormous amount of energy making the heart beat, you know, keeping the arteries and veins, you know, in good repair and all that. We spend a lot of energy circulating fluid. Most animals spend a lot of energy circulating fluids. Plants just lie back and let chaos take its course. But of course, chaos doesn't do it. You have to have a system designed, you know, to do that. So if you had this was a living cell, the whole system would break down and you'd get nowhere. And if plants didn't have a wall, you could never even start building this system. And so you have to have lots of design features lined up in a row in order to make this work. Uh, and so there's uh, two different reasons. Osmosis gets the water in the root in the first place. Turner pressure pushes it into the xylem. Uh, some of you may have done this, or you can try it. <clears throat> if you have a little plant, uh, you know, at home, uh, say, you know, with the roots down the soil like that, uh, say it has a couple branches. Well, you can, uh, you know, cut off a branch over here and uh, put a glass tube, attach a little glass tube to the branch and, and a seal it, tie it off, maybe put a little Vaseline around it, and watch. And that little glass tube attached to a plant like that will begin to fill up with water. And so you can watch it, you know, gradually fill up with water pulled out of the ground. 
And depending on how tall the plant is, that center, it might actually spill out. You'd have a little fountain going like that. Now there's an idea for a garden, right? <laughs> People can ask you questions about that, and you can talk about how God capitalized on chaos. He used a random ocean of water molecules to move water uphill, what? At no cost to the plant. The only cost of the plant is you have to have living membranes, but they would have to have living membranes anyway. So there's no additional cost for pumping water uphill. In fact, they aren't pumping it uphill. They're allowing it to flow uphill. They're just opening a channel. And so this is it. As I get to the bottom line first, <laughs> water flowing to the top of the tallest redwood is flowing downhill, energetically speaking. It's certainly flowing uphill against gravity, but it's flowing down an energy hill you'd actually have to do something to keep it from flowing uphill. It's actually easier for it to flow uphill than not. You would have to interfere with the process. And so again, the, the glory goes not to the chaos, but to the God who designed the system. Uh, you know, to keep those things going for four and a half thousand years, they don't have to worry about their heartbeat wearing out. <laughs> Water just naturally follows this uh, motion from high to low concentration. Okay, so here's the whole plant. And I marked that little part at the bottom. And so here, um, moist soil, you know, osmosis draws the water into the cell. Turner pressure pushes it to the next cell, and then turner pressure pushes it into these dead, hollow xylem cells, and it begins to move up the plant. Now, it turns out uh, that turner pressure, uh, you know, the, the diffusion pressure deficit there is about four. Uh, and four atmospheres would be roughly 60 pounds per square inch. And that will move water several feet up a plant. But a redwood is more than several feet. It's several hundred feet. And so turger, our, uh, uh, the turger pressure will push water up you know, so far. Get plants started. Any seed would be getting up to grow bushes this tall. But if you're going to get water, and of course, by the way, you have to start small in order for this to work. But if a redwood sea sprouts, you know, it's, the water goes all the way up to the first leaves. And then when you get to the first leaves, now you get another phenomenon going on. Okay, so up here in the leaf cell, and I think I have that uh, kind of uh, marked out here. And so I've got the, the diffusion pressure deficit here of, of five. And that's a result of six, the normal osmotic pressure of a leaf cell or most any other plant cell, minus one. Well, was I just cheating? Did I just do that to make it come out right? And so notice as water is flowing up the plant, it goes from a diffusion pressure deficit, a suction pressure, so to speak, of near zero, about 0.1, uh, to four, oh, no, that's the part in here. Uh, I'm reading the wrong column. One to two to three to four to five and then to ten. Okay, it's flowing downhill. Uh, the uh, diffusion pressure deficit, the tendency of water to move in that direction, is increasing from one to two to three to four to five uh, for different reasons. Sometimes it's osmotic pressure, sometimes it's turgor pressure. Why was the turgor pressure so low up here? And the answer is evaporation. So again, nothing special. It's just evaporation. When you have uh, dry air, and that's something you have no shortage of around here, <laughs> we have a whole different problem in Florida. <laughs> and by the way, there are a lot of plants that can't grow in Florida because they can't move any water. You know, they, they, they can't do it. Okay, but up here, you know, this part's not going to be a hard problem, or in the desert in San Diego. And so when you get to the leaf cells, the leaf cells have lots of air spaces, and, uh, which root cells don't have. Of course, root cells are underground in a water-soaked environment. Here, the leaf cells are up here in the air with air spaces open to the air, encouraging <coughs> evaporation. These little things are designed so they can open and close. They don't want to lose too much water. But they let the water evaporate. And so that lowers the turgor pressure. The osmotic pressure drew the water. Uh, the DPD or xylem, as I mentioned, was about four, uh, just as normal osmotic pressure of, of uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> mineral-rich water with no turgor pressure. Uh, but up here, 
the turgor pressure drops because the water evaporates, so the cell tends to shrink and therefore it can absorb more water and still stretch. And so as long as you have dry air, I've got 10 here, but the diffusion pressure deficit of dry air in a desert on a warm day with the wind blowing can reach over 100. Okay, so now you're talking about an incredible amount of of suction pressure drawing water up out of the soil. And of course, desert plants have all kinds of things to stop it so they don't lose too much water uh, directly by evaporation. Redwoods, on the other hand, encourage this. And so as long as they've got continuous evaporation, uh, and evaporation from a leaf gets a special name, transpiration. <coughs> Excuse me. As long as water can evaporate from the leaf cells, that will keep the turgor pressure down and uh, the diffusion pressure deficit up and the water moves all the way up to the plant. Uh, now this, uh, by the way, let me say this first. Uh, this is contrary to what a lot of people once thought, uh, that uh, a redwood is like a straw. You know, our plant's like a straw. And so when you, uh, you know, suck water or, you know, well, you know here's an example. <laughs> okay, you have one of these things. And, you know, you're used to, you know, this is just water, by the way. Take my word for it. <laughs> you think of yourself as, you know, sucking water out of the glass or Coke or whatever. You aren't really doing that. What you're doing is sucking the air out of the straw which creates a low pressure in the straw, and it's the outside air pressure that pushes the water up into the straw. How can you prove that? You get a really good seal. Okay, you can take a cup like this if you want, you know, and put some Vaseline and some gum around it. Seal it so no air can get in, and what happens? You know, you just try and try and try, and you'll get water up a little ways, but not very far. You have to have the outside air pressure. That's why, you know, the cups always have a little vent in them or something like that in order to get that going. And uh, so uh, now suction pressure is so lowering air pressure, pulling the air out of a out of a straw or out of a pipe, you know, with a vacuum pump, uh, can raise water about 30 feet. If you had a really, really, really good vacuum pump, uh, you could get water about 30 feet. And you can measure, you know, pressure in terms of inches of water or in terms of uh, millimeters of mercury. <laughs> this would be a dangerous experiment, but you can use a shorter straw to demonstrate it. <laughs> Instead of a 30-foot straw, if you had a little beaker of mercury, which I did as a kid. Nobody knew that it would give you, you know, a man had his disease and all that. <laughs> yeah, I probably would have done this if somebody had given me a straw. You know, you put a glass tube in there and try to suck out mercury. Well, of course, it weighs 13.6 times as much as water. You'd be lucky to get it up that far. The outside air pressure wouldn't push it very far. And same thing for plants. That you can get, you can't get very far. Under ideal perfect conditions, you can only get water up about 30 feet. And so uh, uh, a lot of people have a mistaken notion that a redwood is a big suction pump. Uh, and it's just like a vacuum pump pulling water out of the soil. It won't do it. A vacuum pump analogy will work for bushes this high, and that's pretty much it. And uh, so the theory is called evapotranspiration. You have to have evaporation at the top. Uh, and, and what's going on here then is you're using a combination of osmotic, well, basically osmotic pressure, uh, and uh, you know reducing the turgor pressure, and that can reach uh, much greater magnitudes of force than a regular vacuum pump can. And so there's uh, the limits on this kind of pump. I mean, you could make one that could go much higher than a redwood, uh, but it also requires something else. This only works if you're trying to move a fluid that's really sticky. Now, most of you don't think of water as sticky. You think of syrup as sticky. Uh, but chemically, water is very, very sticky. And so it's, it has cohesion. Water molecules tend to stick together. Uh, each water molecule looks like a little Mickey Mouse head. So the oxygen molecule is like that, and then the two hydrogens look like mouse ears. And there's uh, 104 and a half degrees between the two of them and so on. 
And the, the little mousier hydrogen atoms have a slightly positive charge and the big oxygen has a slightly negative charge. And so they tend to attract each other, plus and minus charges. So water is very sticky or very cohesive. And of course you see that in a variety of ways. The skin, uh, you know, on the top of a pond or, you know, a beaker or a glass of water. You know, water forms a little skin and certain kinds of water bugs, you know, can scooter around on this little skin. Or, uh, surface tension, you know, of water. Uh, and of course, if you have water.